there anyone in here that would like to get um, the free eye screening but has not signed up for it yet? If you haven't signed up, I need you to call the church office tomorrow because I need to turn in a number and if I don't have 12, they're not going to do it. And right now, I don't have 12 people. So if you want it, please call and uh, get your name on the list. Uh, free, you know, doc, certified doctors, they, got their, they, got, they have their degrees, so, you know, they're going to bring the equipment here. Uh, so if you, if you, you know, to me, everybody should get it, you know. If you, if you don't go to your doctor, I doctor on a regular basis. Because you, as you get older, you never know. You might have a little, you know, uh, glaucoma, a little cataract after you. So I would say do it. Uh, also, and I'll, I'll re-announce this at the end of the service, is that um, we have been selected as a, uh, a site um, to, uh, as a pilot site for remote uh, vaccinations, COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, what they're looking at, you know, trying to, as you know, everybody's trying to increase the rollout. And, and right now, what they, they also know that it's uh, in the minority population, especially in uh, African Americans, is less than 6% of people getting vaccinated are African Americans. So, so what, they, what, they, what they looked at, they want to consider using the, uh, you know, the black churches because their feeling is, you know, people will feel more comfortable if they see, you know, the, the, you know, the black church involved. So they picked Enoch to be the pilot for that program. Those vaccinations are going to be done on February the 13th from 10 to 3. Now here, you know, because as you know, they're in a 1B category still, okay? So if you are 65 and over, you're in 1B. So you, that's the target, 65 and over. If you are between 17 and 65, and you have an underlying condition, and, and, and I will, I'll have, you know, some of you already know what those conditions are, but if you don't, tell me, I'll give her the list of what those conditions are, then you can also, you know, you're 1B as well. If you are an essential worker, you still 1B. So let's say you, you, you know, you, you, the checkout person at Kroger, you're, you're an essential worker, okay? So um, we will probably only have, because they said they're going to give us uh, 200 vaccinations. That's all they're going to give us initially. But they said they could give more, but that's what they're thinking unless we get a lot of people signed up ahead of time. They don't want to bring vaccine, you know, the, the, the stuff out here and it go bad. So if you know people that are 65, and we'll, the focus is on people in Virginia Beach, obviously, that, you know, people in Virginia Beach. If you are 65 and over, then call the church so we can get you hooked up for your vaccine. If you are in 1B category because you have an underlying condition, call the church, we'll get you up for the vaccine, okay? For those of you who may be uncomfortable taking the vaccine, they, you know, they asked me to let you know if I was going to take it. And yes, I'm going to take it, okay? Yeah, I'm not 65 yet, but I'm right around the corner. I'm so close that it don't matter. So I'm going to take it. I would advise all of you who are eligible to take it, okay? Because you want to protect yourself from those people that don't take it. Okay? So, yes, sir. It's going to be 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. But when you sign up, we'll give you your slotted time. So that way you don't have to, you know, come and stand in line for a long time. Yeah, so what happens is when we sign you up for the first one, you automatically sign up for the second one. Yes. It'll either be Pfizer or Moderna. It'll be one of the two. If, if it's Pfizer, you'll get your second one in three weeks. If it's Moderna, you'll get your second shot in four weeks. Get whatever they got. I want the three-week one myself. I want the three-week one. 
Yeah, because, you know, I don't trust y'all. No, Pfizer is three weeks. Moderna is four weeks. Right. Maybe I need Moderna. I'm already cool enough. I don't need it. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm taking the first thing smoking. Whatever they get put in my arm, they're going to put in my arm and I'm moving on. Happy. Okay. Right. Now you still wear your mask even if you get it, you know, even if you get it, but at least you know you're covered. Right. So, uh, so, but anyway, okay. And, and, and Sister, Sister Hendricks will be sending something out, you know, to let church folk know as well, so we can uh, make sure that everyone is aware, uh, so we can get it. How many of you all get the emails and read them when, they, when Sister Hendricks sent them out? Wow, not many people, huh? Okay, we might have to try. I mean, I hate to keep using the, um, the telephone call, robocall, because robocalls are so expensive. It costs like $600 every time we use it. But, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll re-announce this at the end of the Bible study for people who just came in. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I don't have a problem. I, I sure will. Uh, I'll take a picture of me getting a shot, and I'll be like this is waving. Like I even take my mask off so you can see the smile. Okay, we're in Ephesians chapter six, and uh, we're scheduled to start in verse fifteen. Before we get started. We're going to uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we again have come recognizing the wonder of your grace and your mercy. We're so thankful that you have blessed each of us with a touch from your hand. Thank you for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for that movement that has embraced us and kept us down through the ages. We thank you for your healing power because we know without you, we would not be able to be in this building today. So Lord, we lift you up and we praise your name for all that you are and all that we know you're going to do. We ask you to give us the wisdom, understanding, and the perseverance that we may be living examples of children of a living God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we were in uh, Ephesians, um, and we're supposed to be starting in chapter fifth, excuse me, chapter six, verse fifteen. Uh, but just to kind of get us back to where we, um, you know, uh, you might want to turn me down just a little bit because it's a little feedback coming. Uh, so we we are, uh, you know, we've been talking. We're talking about putting on the whole armor of God, right? So uh, if you if you look at it, uh, if we start in verse thirteen where it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And so, as we conclude the chapter, you know, Paul has gone through and talked to us about a lot of things, and then as he concludes the, uh, not just the chapter, but as he concludes the book, he tells us, that in order for us to accomplish those things that he has outlined previously, it will be necessary for us to use an arsenal that God has granted us. And that is he's saying, if you, if you don't use this, then you put yourself in peril. Because you need to be covered completely in order to put up with some stuff. And I think most of us who are in here are grown adults. We understand that to be true. Now, we don't always use the whole arm of God. And that is why we oftentimes get frustrated with people. Okay. Because if you think about those things, those times that cause you to get out of your spiritual self and cause you to get back to your old worldly self, you know, those times when you are happy to tell other people, don't make me have to lay down my religion, right? Those are those times when we are not using the whole arm of God. Paul tells us, if we use the whole arm of God, we will not be frustrated by the actions of others, all right? Nor the trials and tribulations that life often brings. So, 
He tells us to take all of the armor, right? 14, just quickly, uh, he said we need to have our loins girt with truth, and we must have the best breastplate of righteousness. And we talked about that, and we were saying, right, well, you need truth because the devil is a liar, right? So you need to know the truth because one of the ways that Satan causes people to get off track is to use deceit. And so if you know the truth, it keeps you where you need to be because you can recognize when Satan is trying to pull you off track with the lie. And you must have righteousness. And we said you must have righteousness because you have to be in the right frame of reference, right? If you're not in the right frame of reference, if you, if you are not in a position where you want to be right, then you will yield and be wrong, okay? And so he starts out with those two uh, 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 parts that he said we, we must take. Now that brings us to verse 15. He says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, what makes that so important? Ephesians chapter 6. Oh, I forgot you weren't here. Yeah, Ephesians. You, you, you don't watch me on the... Okay. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Okay. Now, two things I want to point out. One says shod with the preparation. So we want to look at that word preparation, right? And then he says with the gospel of peace. Okay. So preparation. So what does preparation mean? To be prepared, right? And what are we going to be prepared with? The gospel of peace. So what we're going to be prepared with, he says, is that which the gospel has taught us on how to walk peacefully. The thing that we have to do to walk peacefully. Okay? Now, why would he say prepared to be shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace? And to be shot means what? You're just going to put them on. So you always have to have it on, he's saying, right? And you always have to have it on when? Right. In other words, this is what he's saying. If you're not prepared to be peaceful, you will go to war. Okay? Paul is saying you, must re you, you have to rehearse being peaceful. You have to already know, he's saying, what you will do based on certain situations in your life. Now, if you think about this thing, most of, many of us do the opposite. We don't prepare to be peaceful. We prepare to cuss you out. Right? We are put in our mind, when I see this person, oh, they're going to they get a piece of my mind. That's what we are preparing for. We're preparing for war. So when you see the person, and they, and they try to give you three or four excuses, what do you do? You go ahead and curse them out. Why? Because you already put in your mind. Let them lie to me one more time. I'm going to cuss them, slam out. And that's what you do, because that's, that's what you have prepared yourself for. So he says we have to always be ready and always tell ourselves how we're going to react when folk act the fool. Because they are going to act the fool. And you know they're going to act the fool. Has anybody ever acted the fool around you and it was a complete surprise? Never happened, does it? Because you know who all the fools are in your life, correct? And you know they're going to act the fool, and you know what situation they're going to act the fool. Has anybody lied to you and you thought to yourself, and you might have thought this, but you know you really didn't mean it. I can't believe you lied to me. Now, you say that right, but what you really thinking? I knew you were going to lie. True ain't never been in you. Right? All thing you saying is, why would you lie to me and you know I know you lying? Right? But the reality is, you know they're going to lie to you, and then when they lie to you, what do you do? Get mad and want to fight. Why? You should want to fight if they told you the truth. 
Because that's when they tricked you up. Because you used to them lying, but you used to them telling the truth. So what Paul says, you ought to always be prepared for the lie. And if you're prepared for the lie, you don't get mad. For example, if, 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 the, 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 why, why are we afraid of pit bulls? Because what? Right, it's a perception, right? Because all pit bulls don't bite and don't let go, right? But the perception is what? The pit bulls are mean and they're violent, right? So if, you, if your neighbor has a pit bull and your child hits the ball in their yard, would you walk in the yard and get the, get the ball out? Now, if, if the pit bull get out the house, right, by mistake, and you see your mailbox is 20 feet from your door, but the pit bull is running around out there, would you go to your mailbox? Why? Because you might get big. Now, in this, see, as a matter of fact, you ain't gonna get mad because the pit bull growl. Because you know what? You expect the pit bull to growl. So you're just gonna come in your house and get mad at the person for letting the dog out, not at the dog. Because you expect the dog to growl, you expect the dog to bite. Why is it that we expect people to tell the truth? Oh, oh, right. See, there you go. You're right. See, you hope, but that's the point to you. You hope they tell the truth, but why do you expect liars to tell the truth? Everybody in here has been taught to lie, and we ain't stopped. And the Bible says, which is going to be the next book we're going to go over, if you say you don't lie, you are a liar. <laughs> right? And we are taught to lie. When did we start, when did, when did you start being taught to lie? When you was a little kid. Because when somebody lied to you, they're teaching you to lie. And they, some of us were taught to lie because we were told to lie. How many of you heard this from their parent? Tell them I ain't home. Right? Isn't that a lie? So somebody taught you to lie. So now that you're an adult, we expect you to stop doing what you were taught to do by another adult. Follow me? Yeah. So what Paul says is, if I am already preparing for that, it won't upset me so much. That's why you want to be prepared for people. Be prepared for the worst. If you are prepared for the worst, nothing they say will bother you. Above all, take this, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Right? So he says this, the only thing you've got to hold on to when you get in trouble is your faith in God. Okay? Your faith in God. If you think about why most people hurt you, they hurt you because you don't believe this is going to be to your, your benefit. Well, think about that for a minute. How many of you believe the Bible? How many of you believe the Bible is without error? Okay, well, let's take a verse in the Bible then. All things work together. For what? The good. To what people? Him that loved the Lord and are called according to his purpose. How many of you all believe that? If all things work to the good of them who love the Lord, and if you love the Lord, and you are called according to his purpose, then why then do you get upset with anybody who does anything to you? Because that would mean that God got a reason for them to do it. But the end result is going to be for your good. How many of you all know who Joseph was? Right? Joseph got sold by his brothers into slavery. Was that a good thing? But what did it result in? So first he becomes a slave, right? Then, after being a slave, he gets put in jail. 
So he slaved for many years, jailed for many years. No, that sounds good, does it? But after that, what does he become? Second in command under Pharaoh. Now who would have thought when he was locked up in jail that God would use jail to get him to be brought before Pharaoh? So if I have faith, that means I don't get upset at my situations because I believe God's going to take the bad and turn it into good. Where people thought to bring me down, God's going to use that to lift me back up. And that's what he's saying when he's saying what? You have to use your faith to go against the fire and darts of the devil. You have to believe that. And when you believe that, you will still rise above all the devil is trying to do to bring you down. All right? And take the helmet of salvation, which should be straightforward, obvious stuff, right? Because anybody here not saved? So I ain't got to spend a lot of time on that. All right? And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Right? Why the word of God? It's self-explanatory. should be anyway, right? Goes in line with the truth. Right? That if you have God's word, you have what you need to combat any situation. Has anyone in here read the Bible all the way through? I know I've got some folk have. Okay? Is there any situation you can think of that has not been represented in the Bible? Anybody been cheated on? Lord, all y'all need to raise your hand. Oh, you don't know you've been cheated on. That's what it is. <laughs> you ain't found out yet. Okay. In the Bible, guess what? There are stories about people who what? Got cheated on. Anybody ever got beat up by a gang of people? There are stories in the Bible about people getting whooped up by other people. Anybody got, well, you might not have got raped, and, you know, so I don't want you to raise your hand for that. But if you have been raped, guess what? Rape is in the Bible. If you have a problem with your wife, guess what? There's a story about a man who had a problem with his wife. You got a problem with your husband? Same thing, it's in the Bible. If you ain't got no money, that's in the Bible. Right? If somebody wants you for your money, that's in the Bible. Every problem you can come across is in the Bible. And that's why the sword of the, the word of God is so important because that will give you what you need to overcome your problems. All right? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching therefore with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying in the spirit. The reason why he's saying pray in the spirit because a lot of folk pray but not in the spirit. What is the difference do you think between praying in the spirit and not praying in the spirit. Say again. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. When Jesus prayed, the model prayer, was he using scripture? No. Was he praying in the spirit? Yes. Right? So it's not just using what? The scripture. It is using what Jesus said, right? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Oh! But what did I just say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right? On earth as it is in heaven. When Paul says praying in the spirit, he said praying so that there's an agreement between you and the God that you serve, right? Because the Spirit is the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is in the triumphness of God. The reason why I say that people who don't pray in the Spirit, 
Because there are a lot of folks that pray for stuff that they know God don't want. Do you know there are women that are praying to get your husband? You think I'm kidding? If you've got a good husband, you better believe somebody praying for him. They're hoping you're going to fall down so they can snatch him up. Now, is that praying in the spirit? No. There are people that will pray for you to fall because they don't like you. But is that praying in the spirit? No. There are people that will pray to be rich just because they are selfish. But they're not praying in the spirit. See, know what he says. With perseverance and supplication for all. With perseverance meaning what? You don't give up on God. With supplication for all means what? My prayer is not selfish. My prayer is for universal, for us to be better. It might mean I need to be better for you to be better. But my reason for being better is not selfish. It's because I want you to be better too. If In order for um, the, the, the Philistines to be defeated, David had to be a better warrior. So he prayed for himself to go against the lion, but his reasoning was not for him, it was for what? His nation. It's a similar concept. Then he says this, and 19 through 24, I mean, all of us are important, but I also want you to understand the importance of 19 through 24. Then he says them, pray for that, but then pray for me. He says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Right? So Paul says, even though I am your spiritual lead, even though I am the one that's teaching you, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me that I speak the gospel the way Christ intended it to be spoken. And I need you to pray for me so I don't let you scare me out of not preaching it the way I'm supposed to preach it. That's what Paul is saying. He said both. Okay? Because there are, there are preachers I'm sure you can identify with some of them that their messages are generated to make you happy and not to make you better. But every message should lead you to be better, not just to be happy. It shouldn't be just so you can agree with them all the time. So if you never, if you never walk out of Enoch mad at me, I didn't do my job. Whether it's in Bible study or whether it's in a, in a sermon, because if you don't, if you don't get mad at you, you will never get better. Because if you don't get mad at you, you're not going to change who you are. And if you don't change who you are, you won't be better. And so what Paul is saying, pray for me that I can speak boldly. Now, what does that do if you pray for me, not Paul, but if you pray for me, Michael Daniels, to speak boldly to you? Right, but you're right. I'm speaking the truth, right? If you're praying for but what does it do for you as well? Right, you'll change, and why will you change? Because you're being receptive, right? If you're, if you're praying to the Lord, Lord, I need you to tell you, I need, I need the unadulterated facts. I need, I need the, the fire and brimstone sermon, Lord. Give, I need it, I need it, I need it. If you're praying to God for it, right, and God give it to me, he's also going to give you a mind to receive it. Because that's what you was praying for. So when you get it, it also benefits you as well. Okay? That's why, you know, as, as people, you know, say, well, we don't say it too much in Baptist churches, but in the Pentecostal churches it was a common saying, that when there was prayer in the pews, there's power in the pulpit, okay? Because the concept was everybody out here needed to be praying for the preacher so he can bring the word, and the word will come with power 
so he can change lives. Right? See, just like on Bible said at night sometimes. Y'all probably praying in the pulpit, but because y'all got the mask, I mean the pews, but because y'all got the mask on, it don't feel like y'all praying. You know? I feel like y'all saying, uh, he ain't done yet. Hurry up. Hurry up. So anyway, that's what he's saying to do. He says, then he concludes with why he wants you to pray for him as well. He said, but which I am an ambassador in bonds that I may speak boldly as I ought, but that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things who I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs, that he might comfort your hearts. And then he gives a salutation. Peace be to the brothers, to the brethren, and love of faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So he says, listen, I want you to pray for me so I can speak boldly, but I also know on the flip side, I want to be able to give you all the facts about my needs. I want to give you everything that's in my head. Note that he said that, we, that you may know my affairs and how I do. Okay? Paul is recognizing something that, you know what, I need you to pray for me, not based on your thinking that I am perfect, but based on the real person that I am. That you'll pray for my weaknesses as well as my strengths. But also he's saying, if you know the needs and how I'm doing, you will be more apt to try to assist in making sure those needs are met. Not just him personally, but the ministry that he has been given by God. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, come on, we need some what? Prayer in the pews. So we can get some power with the pulpit. Okay? Any questions about that? No questions? Okay. So let me give you one of my needs right quick. I need at least 12 people to sign up for uh, get their eyes checked. Right? I need 12. I got seven. If we're going to use these folks, and we want to use them, not use them and abuse them, use them, but we want to make sure that when people avail themselves to us, Right? That we take advantage of it. So I need, I know y'all know some people that can't have sleep. I know you do. What is it, she? Go quick, but they're dead, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> don't be ashamed. Sign up, it's free. You don't have to be over 65. They just want to get people over 65. Anybody can get their eyes checked. Okay? So if you know some, some, some people over 65, tell them, sign up. And then you pick them up and bring them here so you know they're here. Right? Because they're going to be afraid to come because they're going to say, you know I'm old. You know they got COVID going around. I can't be going out. You say, listen, you got to come into the sanctuary. You're going to come in. We're going to take you to a dark room. They're going to check your eyes out. Then you can go right back and get the car to church over with. Then you take them back home. Or you can just take them back home and get back in time for the sermon. Okay? No, it's going to be the, the uh, 21st, 21st, yeah. You know we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. Lord, no. You know. Now, I know y'all love the Lord and everything. But I also know we couldn't do it on Super Bowl Sunday. I know we couldn't do it on Valentine's Day because we got lovers in the house, right? So we had to choose the 21st when, you know, you then you gave somebody the gift and then they didn't dump you because they got the gift. <laughs> Right, you got your eyesight, you can find them, right? <laughs> you know that's right. You <laughs> okay. Any questions? Any questions? No questions? All right, let's roll in. Yes. Um, for that, on Sunday, is it possible to have a sign next week or in the lobby, maybe? Because sometimes people, we say call the church office, but day to day, 
you know what's a good idea? That's a sign in, a sign out sheet tonight, right? That's a good idea. Uh, Miss Ruth, can you do me a favor? Can you go get a piece of paper and put it out there so that when people leave, they can sign up for the I thing if they want to? I, I don't know if you're nodding yes or no. You, you Minister Williams? Aren't you Minister Williams? <laughs> Am I wrong? Do I need to get my eyes checked too? Isn't that who it is? Oh, no, that's Joshua. No, I mean, that is Mr. Williams. Eh? I thought that's who it was. Okay, is it? Okay. Okay, well, she said she got something right there. And we need, we need their name and telephone number. Well, you've seen the three of us on there, right? Well, I haven't seen the this yet. So that means only four more people. <laughs> Lord Jesus, only four people showed up. That's a, that's a. Look, we're here. I ain't gonna say nothing about it. He can't see. <laughs> look, you know how you be. You know how you be telling people like you say. You say somebody you say, look, I gotta put my glasses on so I can hear you. <laughs> I'm now going to just just sit on the table so when they walk out they can sign. So he got to put a get give you an ink pen, so you know. And, uh, anybody that don't have an ink pen, you really need your own ink pen. But if you ain't got your own ink pen, just use the ink pen, then sanitize your hands, and then walk out the door. The twenty first. We're gonna start them at eleven o'clock, and you know, and let you go until eleven o'clock, till um, yeah, till eleven thirty. And then it's going to be from 12 o'clock, then it's going to start back again at 12 o'clock. Because during the sermon, we can't have y'all marching in and out and disrupting my flow. Right. <laughs> she gave us after the middle appointment. She gave us after the middle appointment. 2.15, 2.30, 2.45. Did she show up? She told us only seven people. I don't know how y'all got that far behind. But, you know, you, listen, you know how I do <laughs> You know y'all favorite people, okay? What time y'all want to get in there? Okay, all right, but I got you covered. I got you, I got you. All right. Okay, we're going to go to First John. I got uh, 7.36, so we can start another book. First John. Is he staying out there? Oh, okay. Okay. You know what happened when you can't see. Don't worry about it. I should have sent you to the Hendricks. I should have known better. But I can't think when I can't see. That's the thing. All right. First John. I like John. I like John. Okay. First John. In 1 John, just to give you a little bit of background, what John, is, what John is writing about is there have come up people who are doubting if Jesus really is the Son of God, right? And so there are some people who have good intentions, but they were teaching that he was not the Son of God, but that he was just a, a prophet, you know, he was a, he was a wonderful prophet. He was a wonderful preacher. And so what John does is he writes to, to try to say, well, listen, I, we need to put this thing to rest once and for all about who Jesus is, whether or not he really is the Christ, and about the relationship that you have with him once you accept him as Lord and Savior. Because there were different ideas about salvation because you have a group of Hebrews, right, who for them... Uh, every time you, you, had, you had various offerings for sin, various offerings for thanksgiving and all this kind of stuff. And so they were kind of mixing things up, saying, well, you know, if you do sin, you got to make sure you, we love the Lord and everything. We know Jesus is who we said, but you still got to bring an offering, you know. So it was all that kind of stuff going on. So he writes to clarify that, okay? 
So he starts out in, in 1 John chapter 1. In the first three verses, what he does is, is he, he sets the stage by authenticating his own message. To say, I want you to understand why what I'm telling you is fact and not conjecture. All right? So here's what he says. That which from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Okay? For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So John opens up by saying, hey, listen. What I teach you is not what I got from somebody else. What I'm teaching you is what we have received from the moment we met this man who called himself Jesus. And he says what? We heard him. We saw him with our own eyes. We looked on him. We handled him. Right? Because the issue that they were dealing with was, is the resurrection true? Is he, if he died and he did not resurrect, he's just a man. He's a, he's, he's a prophet. If he died and really got resurrected and went to heaven, then that shows his divinity. If he really did these miracles, that shows his divinity. And John says, listen, we ain't telling you stuff we heard about. We saw it. We saw him literally walk on water. We were, we were on the ship. And we saw him walk on the water and come to us. As a matter of fact, we watched Peter go out on the water and get scared and then sink. He said, we knew people who were blind, who Christ touched their eyes and gave them sight. We saw this with our own eyes. We beheld him. We saw his pierced side. We touched him and know what? That even though he was dead, he was back alive again. So their testimony is, we know this to be true because our eyes have seen it, our, we have heard it, we were eyewitnesses to who he was. And that's what we've been talking to you about. So we're not just saying something to be saying it, we're trying to help you understand who this person is. Verse 4. He says, and these things work we unto you that your joy might be full, right? So he's telling them that my whole purpose for this is so you can understand who Christ is. And when you understand who Christ is, it will change how you face every day, okay? Because when you don't understand who Christ is fully, your days can be bleak. Your days can be without purpose. Your days can be filled with sorrow. But when you know who Christ is, you can have joy every day. Now, that doesn't mean you might not have a trial or tribulation, but your trials won't take away your joy. And the reason why it won't take away your joy is because you know that all things work together. So even though somebody might be giving you hell on your job on Monday, you know that if you keep your peace and you have already planned for them to give you hell, somebody's going to see the way you react, and you're going to end up supervising the person that was giving you hell. So, okay? So he says when you know Christ and you understand him, you're not walking around with fear. Also, if you do make a mistake and your conscience get the best of you, you know enough about God to know, hey, listen, it's going to be all right tomorrow. I don't have to keep beating myself up because I made a mistake. Everybody good? All right. He says, this then, 5 through 7 is where I'm going now. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness. God is light and in him there is no darkness. 
God only brings things to make you better. He would never bring anything in your life to diminish your life. Okay? If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. We do not the truth. Because if you have fellowship with God, you recognize that since he is light, everything about him is the same way because you are a part of him. And if you walk in Christ and, and you're still thinking that you are going to hell because of something you did, he's saying you really don't understand who he is. Yes, you may. If you, if, you, if you are a mature individual and you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, then you're going to bust hell wide open. Doesn't matter how good you are. Let me, let me say that differently. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. The reason being, none of us are good. See, our concept is, well, I don't cheat, I don't steal, right? So therefore, I'm good. I don't lie. I don't curse. Well, you know, everybody going to lie a little bit. But I don't curse, and I only lie when it's absolutely necessary. So therefore, I'm good. We have missed the greater sin, though. See, the greater sin is I did not recognize who created me. Right? That's the, that, it, it, would be, it would be just like you got your children. Right? It would be just like one of your children telling somebody else, that ain't my mama. You know what I'm saying? For, for your child to deny you is worse than your child not to wash dishes. See, we take the little sin and act like it's the big sin. The lying ain't the big thing. Lying is a small thing. It's the denying Christ is the big thing. Well, your understanding is right on target, okay? But, and here's, here, here's what the Bible says, okay? I'm in, I'm in the Gospel of John now, okay? For God sent not his Son unto the world to condemn the world, but that the world, well, let me make sure everybody knows the question. The question was, if you are a good person, but, if you, but you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, does that mean you're going to go to hell? Okay? Or you, are you condemned? Here's what the Gospel of John says. For God sent not his Son unto the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son. That's John 3, 17 and 18. Right? So clearly it says what? If you don't believe, you already condemned. You must believe to get uncondemned. You saved by the grace of Jesus only if you believe that Jesus is your Lord. Right, right, right. Watching TV, right, right. <laughs> and it's a, it's a what? A, a movie. It was a day ago. It was a movie, right? It was based on a docuseries, though. Where did it show now? Consider something about what the Bible says. Okay? Now this is, I won't say controversial, but it's just what this is, this is what it is. I know you praying for me to speak boldly the truth. Right? Okay, now. The, 
Paul, number one, Paul just said, right, in order for you to get through this thing, you got to put on the whole armor of God. And one of the things he said was, put on some truth. <laughs> Why? So you can't get fooled. Use the sword, the word of God, so you can not be taken by the wiles of the devil. Somebody may have told you this movie is accurate, but that don't mean the devil ain't using this movie to trick some folk into thinking you don't need to get saved. When the Bible clearly says you need to get Christ in your life. Okay? Now, here's the other thing. Let's say, let's say that you, you, haven't, you, you haven't acknowledged God as God, right? The Bible says in the book of, in, in Romans, that all of us have within us a desire to know God and to, and to accept who God is, okay? The issue is, do we acknowledge God as Father? Right? Do we acknowledge him as Father? If I acknowledge him as Father without the Son, I still haven't acknowledged him as Father. The question becomes is, can I, do I have a right to go to him without going to the Father? Whereas a Gentile, we don't have that right. The Hebrews had that right. We don't. The other question is, Will everybody on the earth that's ever been born get saved? No. But well, the Bible says that God already, what, has predestined or predetermined, basically, who will get saved. So there are some folk, not just in Africa, that they never heard of them and they won't get saved. Because it's highly unlikely they ain't heard of them. But, you know, it's preached all over the world. But maybe, I don't know, maybe any. If they did not come to that understanding, it ain't necessarily because they didn't have a chance. It's because he already knew they weren't going to do it anyway. So why waste your time? You know? Have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know you had, I just, you know, threw it at it. Okay? What verse was I on, by the way? I gotta answer the question, long track. Hmm? Oh, yeah, five through seven. All right, there you go. So he, he said, What? So seven says, But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from what? All sin. Right? So if I'm walking in the light, if I'm walking under the umbrella of Jesus Christ, because he is the light of the world, if I walk under that light, right, and I'm having fellowship or I'm not connected in with him, it says that the blood cleanses us from all sin. That's the key thing right there. He says all sin, right? Now, you remember there was a commercial that used to be called All and they, they, they advertised how they was great at getting out what? Everything. And he said the blood of Christ does the same thing. Takes out every stain. Now all is not just your past, is it? All is your present and what you will commit that will become your past. Right? So if the blood of Christ is all, that's why you can have joy. Because you already know that if I got Jesus, I got heaven. Any questions on that? Everybody got joy? Right. Now, for some of y'all might say, I thought we already covered this. Yeah, we had it one time, but I said we need to go back. <laughs> mm -hmm. see, why, see why we need to go back? Because you're right here listening to the movies. <laughs> That's why I'm going fast, because we, you know, this is kind of like a, a review, but we're trying to plug, plug some holes in, all right? So if we say that we have no sin, right, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So that's point number one, right? If any, any time you say you have not committed sin, you're just lying to yourself. You know you have, you know? 
And if I have, you have. And if you have, I have. So nobody's better than anybody else. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Right? So the idea of someone saying that I have not sinned is ludicrous if you say you know Jesus. Because he died and sacrificed because we have sinned. And if we had no sin, he would have not needed to die on the cross and shed blood. So for everybody in this room, everybody, everybody, as we always say, Lottie, Dottie, and who? Every dog gone body, right? Everybody in this room has not only sinned past tense, but sinned present tense. And will sin future tense if you keep living. But because you know Christ, you have been forgiven in advance of what you're going to do. That's the, that's the, that to me is the joyful part of being saved. Too many people focus on the perfection of being a Christian. As if being a Christian somehow confers upon you the idea that now you must become perfect. And I have, you know, and we were going through Ephesians, I also tried to point this out to you. That if we are honest with people about who we are, more people would want to get saved. But we don't want to be honest with folk about who we are. You know, we have people in the church that are alcoholics. And they want to lie and say, well, the Lord took the taste right out of my mouth. No, he didn't. It's, you know, I'm just, listen, that's just honest. Okay, who would you rather have, you know, an alcoholic or a murderer? You, you got people that, that, that got all kind of problems. You don't get rid of all your problems because you get saved. You don't. You still got those problems. Right? And that's, and that's the way it is, but that don't mean you're not saved. You know, there are people who are fornicators. The average person that's over 21, okay, back up. The average person that's over 14 is fornicated or gone fornicate or trying to fornicate. Okay? Now, if you ain't fornicating and you're single, it's because you ain't found nobody to fornicate with. <laughs> I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's life. Right? And that's why Paul made the statement. If you can't contain, what? Better to marry than to burn. Because he knows it's in you. It's in you to want to do that which causes procreation. Right? I told you, same thing about lying. You've been taught to lie. And you know why you was taught to lie? Because your parents was taught to lie. And their parents was taught to lie. And their parents were taught to lie. And the first folk that were put on this earth lied. So, you know, being a Christian don't stop you from having those feelings. It don't stop you from wanting to act a fool every once in a while. It don't stop you from, it, it, has being a Christian stop you from wanting that somebody to drop dead? No, I want some folk to drop dead all the time. Now, I mean, I might go back, Lord, forgive me, but at that time, it's like, I wish them jokers would just drop dead. I have seen some folks that I've been saying, I hope they catch COVID-19. You ever been walking through the store and these folks ain't got no mask on? They want to come and ask you a question. Hey, what aisle is such and such stuff on? What? I don't work here. You ain't got no mask on. Nobody asking me any questions. I be thinking, I hope you catch COVID-19 soon you leave this place and get so sick you about to die. But then I got to, you know, you know, back up a little bit and say, I don't really want you to catch it. But at that time, I did. So I'm just saying, we all have that stuff because we're still human beings. The beauty of it, what John is saying is, you've been saved, you've been forgiven of all your sins. Not for you to keep doing them, but so you can have joy in knowing that if you do make a mistake, you're covered. 
Okay? All right, so let me just right quick go back and tell you, I got two minutes, um, that on the 13th, we're going to be having, we, Enoch Baptist Church, have been asked to serve as the pilot for churches to host vaccinations for COVID-19. The reason why they've asked us to host the vaccinations is because they recognize that in the black community, normally the churches are looked upon as being people of truth. Normally, not all the time. But sometimes people are comfortable with the church when they do stuff. So when we're doing vaccinations on that day, priority is people 65 and older. But we're now in category 1B. So category 1B also allows people between the ages of 17 and 64 to get vaccinated if you have an underlying condition. All right, some kind of chronic illness, right? Diabetic, high blood pressure, there's a whole host of things. Uh, the, uh, depressed immune system. Some of the stuff I couldn't believe when I read it. Do you know that high cholesterol is the underlying condition? That's just about 95% of black people. We only know we got it. Plus it all through the roof. Right? So that's the underlying condition. So, but you, we got, we got, we're going to sign you up. You know, we're only going to have a limited number of vaccinations. Priority is going to go to Virginia Beach residents. Well, okay, priority is going to go to people 65 and over, Virginia Beach. Then people with, you know, um, underlying condition. Then people who are essential workers. Essential workers are not just nurses and doctors. Essential workers are people that work at Kroger. Essential workers, you work at Walmart, Target, uh, Burger King, McDonald's. Those, anybody, anyone that got to go to work, even though it's COVID-19, restaurant workers, all those folks are considered essential workers. So, you know. So we got a sign-up sheet back there if for the um, eyes, right? So you want your eyes checked, sign-up sheet. I might have to do a COVID. We're going to start announcing that stuff formally this week, but I'm just giving you all advance notice. If you know some folks 65 or over, or if you fit that category, then call the office. And I know some Henry say y'all ain't going to call, but I believe now that y'all know the need of the pastor, that you're going to make that effort to do that. Because all y'all know somebody over 65 that need that shot that live in Virginia Beach, right? Call and sign up. If you're in the church, don't be afraid to get vaccinated. Okay? Don't be afraid. What's the worst thing to happen? What's the worst thing? Anybody right quick. I got one minute. No, I don't. What? Huh? That ain't the worst thing. That's the best thing that can happen. You save and sanctify. The best thing that can happen is you get to heaven early. And if you don't, you know what, you know, and you know why y'all ain't got joy? Because you don't believe. You just, you just hope you're going to heaven. If you believed it, you can sign up tomorrow. Give me this shot. I don't care if I die. And, and you ain't dead, are you? Still here. There you go. And if I drop dead, don't get scared. Just say, you know what? He gone home to be with his Lord. He knows. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They live in Portland. Right. Yeah, we, they want people to live in Virginia Beach. Because okay. the Virginia, Virginia Beach Health Department that we're, that we're doing. And I don't advocate lying and giving them your address. I don't advocate lying anymore. That might be taking a, a vaccine from somebody else in Virginia Beach that needs it. But sometimes you have them thoughts, you know what I mean? Okay. Now, I, I told them, I said, listen, y'all know I live in Chesapeake. You know what they told me? That's exactly what they told me. You the pastor. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's fine. Well, you ain't 65, no way. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, how much pressure is one of them, too? Is there, listen, it's almost anything. You know, you have an impact, too. Oh, underlying condition. 
Okay, maybe not. I'll take a little too far. Okay, all right. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. So have a beautiful and a safe evening. And I'll, hopefully I'll see you all on Sunday. God bless you. If you're coming on Sunday, don't forget, read what? Chapters 2, 3, and 4 of Genesis. We're going to be rocking in here on Sunday. We're going to have some praying pews and some powerful pulpit activities.